Ballasting tea gauge has turned out to be harder than I thought, but I think I've settled on an option. I've also had some soldering success and tested an option for automatic train detection. Hello. In my last tea gauge video, I tried and ruled out some ballast from teagauge.com. I've seen tile grout used to good effect on another YouTube channel, so I had ordered some on Amazon. In small quantity, I'd only been able to find white grout. This stuff came with a whole load of health warnings, so I wore protective gloves when working with it. It took a little while to brush into shape because it's more powdery than granular. I was also using a brush that was too big for the job at the time. After I sprayed some water onto it, it just turned into a paste, which, to be fair, is what it's supposed to do, though it ought to need mixing. When it dried, it wasn't so bad. There was a definite granularity to it. At the other end of the track, I tried some dry, loose plaster powder and sprayed water onto it. The water had a drop of washing up liquid in it to break the surface tension. In some areas, it produced the look of little stones, but in other areas, the plaster had clumped together into larger lumps that didn't look at all right. Both the grout and the plaster shrunk a fair bit when wet, so brushing it into just the right shape when dry wasn't the way to go. I had another go with plaster, this time smoothing and compacting the plaster before applying the water. When dry, that looked too smooth and didn't resemble ballast. Both the grout and plaster needed painting. I used diluted acrylics. I found that because the powders hadn't been fully mixed with water, like they're designed to be, they were prone to clumping when I added the paint. Next, I bought some grey tile grout at Screwfix. The smallest quantity I could get was 5 kilograms. On the plus side, it didn't have nearly so many health warnings, so it was easier to handle. I didn't spend as much time getting the profile just right with the brush. At this stage, I mostly just wanted to see how this grout would behave. Annoyingly, even when the water is a fine mist, the grout tends to form small clumps when the water hits it, which affects the texture. Overall, it does make the look of small stones, but those clumps are annoying, and in scale terms, even the small stone-like bits are very large. The end result looks similar to the painted, uncompressed plaster powder. I think in both cases, the small stones aren't small enough for tea gauge. The grey grout was also still quite fragile. After it dried, I could squash it very easily with a gentle touch, and it was still quite dusty. I tried some of the grey grout with a 50-50 mix of PVA glue and water, with a drop of washing up liquid. Standard ballasting mix. The washing up liquid is supposed to break the surface tension in the liquids, but watch this. It made a right mess of the grout and didn't soak in at all. That was an immediate fail. I decided to start over on that. I hadn't sprayed the grout with water because of the clumping it causes, but when ballasting model track, wetting is a standard step before the glue and water stage. I tried with a bit more washing up liquid, but no change. I tried spraying the grout first, but again, no joy. I tried a different washing up liquid. The first one was an eco-friendlier concentrate that you mix with water. A more standard one made no difference. Next, I wondered what it would be like if I used the grout more as designed and see how it looked when dry. So I mixed some with water. I think I used too much water though, and somehow some of the powder didn't mix and managed to avoid absorbing any water, leaving little islands of powder. As with the compacted plaster, overall this leaves a surface that's too smooth. Most of the bits in these pictures are debris from the dry islands that I ran my fingers over to see if they'd stuck down. I added some water and PVA mix to an area of grout that had previously been wet with just water and then dried. The idea being to add a seal over it to make it stronger and lock its texture in. I didn't do that on camera, but I could see the mix being absorbed into the grout just like would normally happen with ballast and caught the end of it on camera. Ultimately, once dry, it didn't look different and wasn't much stronger. My last idea was to brush some PVA glue over the section I did with compacted plaster and then dust it with grey tile grout powder. I haven't since gone back over it to clean up the track, but this has given me the best result. I think it does look like the right texture at the right scale. I suspect the plaster will be more brittle than grout, so I intend to try getting the right mix of grout and water to use instead of plaster, which also won't need painting. Ultimately, sprinkling grey grout powder onto PVA as the top layer is my intended solution. For now though, I've had enough of experimenting with ballasting, so I'll leave it for a bit. There's one other thing to note though, and that's the colour. I'm going to be modelling the Dawlish Sea Wall, and I've looked at various photos of the railway through Dawlish. Essentially, the ballast there could be grey or brownish. It probably depends on how long it's been since fresh ballast was last laid. The last few times I've been along the Dawlish Sea Wall myself, I've noticed that there are small stones in the mix. They'll have been thrown onto the railway by the sea during stormy weather. The same stuff regularly piles up on the walkway on top of the wall. 
In between some ballast experiments, I returned to soldering experiments, this time using a more acidic flux and a solder that contains silver. I got some solder onto the rail quite easily. That was a big improvement from last time, and I did eventually successfully get a cable soldered to the rail between sleepers without wrecking the sleepers. That's a result for sure. It means discrete dropper wires will be possible. On another day, I decided to have another go, just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. I got it done more easily and again without scenic side sleeper damage. I hope that as I get more practice I'll be able to get it a bit neater, but I think the right flux, solder and soldering iron are the ingredients for success. Finally to automatic train detection. I bought some infrared detector modules to use with a Raspberry Pi Pico. These have a little divider between an infrared bulb and a sensor. It was a bit fiddly to hold everything in position correctly, but by having the bulb below the gap between one pair of sleepers and the sensor beneath the next gap between sleepers, it was able to detect the presence of a carriage. The module has an LED to indicate it's got power and another one that lights when it's detected something. I also had a short MicroPython program on the laptop showing the digital output from the sensor. The bulb and sensor both span two gaps in the sleepers, so on another day I covered surrounding sleeper gaps, leaving just two adjacent gaps. That still works. The Raspberry Pi Pico that I used here, with headers already attached, was £4.80, and a pack of five infrared sensors was £5.79, so it's a low-cost solution. I've put links in the description. I also tried a current detector module, which came in a pack of two current sensors and two voltage sensors for £5.49. It produces analog output, a voltage which is half its input voltage when no current is detected. But I can't find any information about what it outputs when it detects current. Other similar looking modules say they output an extra 66 to 175 millivolts per amp detected, depending on the module. The readings from this one fluctuate a bit even when there's no current to detect. My T-gauge controller controls train speed by varying the duration of pulses of full power, so for any given sampling period there'll be time when there's no current flowing. By taking an average reading over one second the value consistently went up with train speed, so it works but I think it would take some fine tuning to reliably differentiate between no train present and a train running slowly. I'm not going to need super reliable block occupancy detection for what I want. I just want signals to change after a train has passed them, so I'm leaning towards just using the infrared sensors. That would also avoid the need to electrically isolate sections of rail. Whether or not I'll actually be able to make colour aspect signals that aren't massively overscale remains to be seen. That's all for now. Bye-bye.